Good to see you. So glad that you're in church today. My name is Wes. If I haven't met you, I'd really love to. Uh, actually, after this service, we're, uh, we're doing some baptisms. Some people get baptized in this place, which is really, really exciting. So we're going to end some service with that. Um, so i got to jump into my message because I'm supposed to end early. We'll see if that's possible. I'm not sure. Don't bank on it, but pray for it. Anyway, we have been in a series, and it's called Take the Land. We've been going through parts of the book of Joshua. We're doing something similar that we did four years ago. Four years ago at this time, we bought this building, and we were a nine-month-old church. That was a crazy time. And at that time, we felt like God let lead us into the book of Joshua with a series we called New Ground. We were taking New Ground as a new church family, and now we're doing the same thing four years later. And so we are back in Joshua's chapter 1 through 6. We're taking New land. I don't know if you know this, but four weeks from today, we start the next location of our church called Captivate La Jolla, which is really, really exciting. And you might think, why are we doing that? <laughs> well, it's been five years almost since we started our church, and it's been a crazy run. It's not very easy to start a church in San Diego where only 3% of people go to church, and it's not very easy or cheap to find a space like this. They're not just laying around for free. And uh, then we went through this thing called COVID. It was a really weird time to lead a church and to start a church, um, but it's gone about as good as it could possibly go. God has been really, really good to us. And uh, we've reached a ton of people. We've now seen over 1,300 people give their lives to the Lord and just so many stories and blessings from God. It's been really, really awesome. But about a year ago, we started running out of space. And people were asking, what are we going to do? What's next? And one thought is to get a bigger building as if they're just laying around. They're not. But um, one of the thoughts on that, too, is that we want to end spiritual loneliness. And so we don't want to build a facility that's so big you get lost in it. I'm not saying we'd never have a bigger venue or a bigger space, but we feel like from God, now's the time to multiply. Not just having one bigger one, but many um, all over our city. And so the next one is La Jolla. And so we're really excited about that. God willing, it's the first one of many that are going to come uh, in the future. But at, throughout the summer, we've been having some goals to get ready for La Jolla in our End Spiritual Loneliness Project. So we just wanted to share some of those with you. Here's some of the wins that we've had. In the last couple months, we've raised over $800,000 for La Jolla, and that's from you guys. So we just want to say thank you for your generosity and how amazing that you are to be able to do that. It's really, really, really encouraging. Um, because we asked you to sacrifice, we felt like God tell us to do the same thing. And so $50,000 of that's going to Zeal Jamaica. There is a church in Jamaica that we support financially. Pastor Corey helps uh, lead that, and they're going to every week's services in October. And so we've been to uh, help them kind of get off the ground. And some of you are going on that trip. We have a mission trip going to Jamaica in, um, in October, suffering for Jesus in Jamaica. And uh, someone's got to do it, you know what I mean? But um, their vision is to captivate every corner of Kingston, Jamaica, kind of like ours. And so we're, we're excited to partner um, with them. We had a goal to have 10 small groups. We call them communities here at Captivate for when we start La Jolla. We already have 12 that are confirmed. So you guys are really amazing. We also need people serving. We have over 60 people signed up to serve. And then the last one is we wanted a space at UCSD to be able to gather every week to bring in students and tell them about Jesus. And as of last week, our team has nailed down a space that every single week there's going to be a gathering on campus at UCSD telling students about Jesus. So that's a really big win and uh, exciting. Yeah, we can clap for that. If three people clap, we all have to clap. That's the rule here at Captivate. Here's some things, though, that, that we still need. Obviously, there's still some money. Our goal was to reach a million dollars to help La Jolla get off the ground, and then, like I said, other projects that are coming in um, after that. That money that was given, which is really amazing, was by several hundred people in our church. There are several thousand people that go to church here, and so there's a lot more of you um, that haven't jumped in yet. And so what I want to do is just encourage you to pray about that. Again, even if it's 20 bucks or whatever, um, I'm not so much concerned about how many dollars come in. I'm more concerned about how many people participate. Um, I'm trying to trust the Lord that whatever comes in, that that's what we need, and we're just going to use that because how many know he's Jaira and he's the provider? I like the song. I'm trying to believe it. You know what I mean? If only we could live as good as we sing, we'd have a pretty good life. And so whatever comes in, I'm just trying to trust the Lord with that. But it's exciting to see more and more people say, hey, I want to be a part of that. It gets to be emotional to think about, but five years ago, we had a small group of people that got together and said, hey, let's start a church. <laughs> and they sacrificed and they gave and they jumped in on it. One year later, again, a much smaller group of people than we have now said, hey, let's buy a building. And we had to raise a million dollars in 60 days and somehow it happened and God provided and so most of us weren't here for that, and so most of us are sitting in someone else's sacrifice. And so I wonder what it would be like for someone in La Jolla to sit in your sacrifice and for us to be able to pay it forward. So it's just something for you to think about, to be able to pray, to, to jump in and be a part of that. There's still ways that you can serve. I've been told that the kids' team is the biggest need, and uh, because it is one church, it's kind of exciting to think that if we're starting with one service over there, maybe you could serve once a month at the 9 a.m. in La Jolla, and then you attend the 11 a.m. like we are right now, and uh, the 12.30 or the 5 or whatever, just to be able to be one church. If you're able to do that once uh, a month or once every other month, I'd love for you to talk to the team. I'm out there. And then, of course, pray and show up. Tonight, we have our last open house, our last vision night before we launch Captivate La Jolla. Um, we're going to have our team there. We're going to introduce some of the new staff that we've hired. 
Uh, Pastor Sean, our location pastor, is going to be there talking about ways to get involved. And then I'm going to be preaching a message that God has put on my heart that's different than the one I'm going to preach in about 25 seconds. All right? And so today we're in Joshua chapter 5. Tonight we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I got a message on my heart about being a spiritual first responder. How do we run in when other people run out? And uh, really excited to share that. And then, of course, the launch is on September 24th. That was a lot of info. Let's jump into the message already because we have to baptize people. But why are we asking you to do all these things? Because we're asking you to take the land. And sometimes we don't do that, right? We've been in a series talking about how sometimes we don't do that. We don't make space and time to partner with God, to take land with God. And there's all kinds of things that get in the way. And we've been talking about those things in the series, right? Sometimes we live too safe of a life or we're just trying to get away from the big bad world. And sometimes it's pains from the past. It's false motivations. Sometimes it's sin management, right? This thing we've talked about where sometimes we spend a lot of our spiritual life just trying to stop being so bad all the time, right? I'm just trying to sin less than my neighbor and like maybe that's the goal and it's not, right? We actually get to say yes and take risks for God. And so we've talked about a lot of things in the series about that, but today I want to talk about how sometimes it's hard to follow Jesus when we're trying to get Jesus to follow us. (laughs) It's hard to say yes to Jesus's mission when we're trying to get Jesus to say yes to our mission. You know, sometimes we're off taking our own land, we're fighting our own fight kind of on the side, you know. We're doing what I'll call today side quests <laughs> away from God, and we're trying to get God to partner with us. And those things are very distracting, right, from the thing that God has called us to do in our life. But sometimes when we're in the middle of a side quest, Jesus shows up, and he corrects everything. And that's what happens in Joshua chapter 5. So if you've got a Bible, you can pull it out. We're going to read a couple verses In Joshua 5, at this point, the people of God have consecrated themselves. They've crossed over the Jordan. They have set up the 12 memorial stones in chapter 4. In the beginning of chapter 5, they taste of the first fruits of the promised land. And now they're getting ready for their next fight. They're getting ready for their biggest test. It's this little thing called Jericho. Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Anybody who's seen that VeggieTales episode? Come on, Joshua and the walls. Where are the real Christians at? There they are. Come on. If you're not a Christian, you've never heard it, you're like, what is that, a keto snack? Maybe. I don't know, right? Don't worry about it. Christians are weird. Anyway, um, but as they're getting ready for Jericho, Jesus shows up to Joshua, and he shows up with a sword in his hand. I don't know if you can imagine that, but uh, Jesus shows up just to clarify some stuff before they go into battle. He clarifies their roles, you know, between him and Joshua, just in case Joshua thought he was in charge. Just in case Joshua thought this battle was on him, just in case Joshua, like us, got caught up with a really cool side quest, um, Jesus shows up and he clarifies some stuff. And we're going to read about it now. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13. I got three verses to read. Is that okay? Either way. Okay, here's what the Bible says. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, and the word behold tells us that he was startled, he was shocked, he was not ready for this. A man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand, right? Which are fighting words. If you come up to me with a sword, whether it's sheathed or unsheathed, I'm going to like freak out a little bit, right? That's a sword, right? What, what are you doing with a sword in your hand? I would probably ask you, what Joshua asks him, are you on my side? You know, like, are you for me? Are you for me? And that's what he says. Are you for us? Or are you for adversaries? The man looked at him and said, no, (laughs) which is funny because it's not really a yes or no question. You know, I just want to know if you're for me. Like, you on my side? You have a sword in your hand. That's really weird, right? You brought a sword to church. Why? I just want to know if you're on my side. He says, no, I'm not here for that. Actually, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Joshua realizes it's God, and he falls on his face to the earth, and he worshiped. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant, verse 15, last verse, and the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Jesus shows up to Joshua. And if you're wondering how I know it's Jesus, I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, all right? But he shows up with a sword in his hand. Can you imagine that? That would be a crazy scene. I'd be a little bit worried, you know? And so I'd probably ask him what Joshua asked him. Are you on my side or their side? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? And that's what I called the message for today. Which side are you on? Right? And speaking of sides, how about the last presidential election? Who did you vote for? By a show of hands, who voted for our current? <laughs> kidding, kidding. Don't do that. Nobody raised your hand, right? That would have been weird, right? That would have been a bad day in church. No, let's do something more relevant. How about picking sides at home? Do you ever have to do that? Sometimes I have to pick sides in my house. I don't know if you know this, but I actually have two women in my life. And uh, I know, that doesn't sound very pastor-like, 
you know, sometimes it's fun having women fight over me. And by women, I mean my wife and my four-year-old daughter. Yeah. And because of that, there's like this tension in the house. There's this rivalry between them. It's getting kind of weird for me and the boys, you know, as the women fight over the prize, which is me, by the way. Uh, (laughs) Sometimes I'm like, ladies, listen, there's only one of me, you know. Calm down. That's a lot of pressure on me. Anyway, but sometimes I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of two spicy Latinas. You can pray for me. And uh, it's hard. My life is hard. But um, what will happen is my daughter will go to my wife and she'll say, hey, hey, mommy, can I have some candy? And 95% of the time, that's a no, right? But my daughter's very stubborn, like her mother. And, um, and so she'll go to mommy and she'll say, mommy, can I have a lollipop or ice cream? And my wife, like Jesus, will say, no, you know, like that's too limiting of a question for how all powerful I am in the situation. That's the wrong question. But again, she's very stubborn, runs in the family. And so she will then come and find me in the other room. And she will say, daddy, I love you, you know, and she'll give me a big hug. And then she'll ask me, can I have a lollipop or candy? And 95% of the time, daddy says, yes, you know, give me a big hug. She'll then run off in the other room. And then I hear a yell, babe, get out here. Am I in trouble? I am in trouble, you perceive correctly. And then I'll go outside in, in the kitchen, and my wife says, hey, listen, I, I said no, right? You, she can't have that. You need to take it out of her hand now. And then I'll look over at my daughter, and she's like, who, me? <laughs> you know, like, it's just perfect. And then I'll look back at my wife. She's babe, take it out of her hand, right? Which side are you on? And I want to say, no, I'm on Jesus' side, you know? And that never works. (laughs) Like, really what she's saying is you're on my side or you're on the couch, you know? Like, do you like to eat food? Um, If you take a step back for a moment from the situation, what's really happening? What's really happening here is my wife and I are on the same team and that we are being pitted against each other. And if that is the case, isn't the one who's pitting us against each other actually our enemy? Even if they're a really, really cute one, you know? (laughs) The problem is the devil's not very cute, and yet he does this to us all the time as the church. I think perhaps it's his number one tool that the enemy uses against the church, certainly in the last three years, but let's be honest, probably the last 2,000 years, is division. It's to divide us. It's to get us to pick sides, right? It's to get us to bicker over what I'll call non-primary issues, to take minor things and make them into major things so that we don't have unity anymore and we're on sides. He wants to divide us. Why? Here's why. If our enemy can divide us, our enemy can defeat us. Um, Not for eternity, but like for the here and now because we don't have unity anymore. I don't think we can underestimate how powerful unity is, right? Like when was the church most unified? I would argue in the very beginning when the church first started in the book of Acts. It's insane what they were able to accomplish in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the remarkable story of how a really common, ordinary group of people catalyzed the largest religious movement in the history of the world. And it was very blue collar people. We're talking fishermen, an IRS agent, a doctor in residence, many great women. Um, who had no social rights at the time. Like, never before had a more important task been given to a less capable group of people. And yet it happened. They made a disciple in every nation in the world. And that's crazy. Even if you don't believe in Jesus, that's nuts that that actually happened. It's, it's historic, right? It really, really happened. Like, Jesus was a real person. Even people that don't believe he's the Savior. He really lived his life for 33 years, and then he died, and we believe he rose again, right? He appeared to about 500 people over 40 days. And then at the very end, he gets together his ragtag group of followers, right, who are not really like the Avengers. They're more like the seven dwarves. And he pulls them together, and he says, hey, I want you to make a disciple in every nation in the world. And they don't know how big the world is. There's no internet. There's no TikTok. There's no Christian mingle. Can you imagine that? And it doesn't exist, and yet he tells them to do it. And then he levitates up into the clouds and disappears, <laughs> And the Gospels are over. Like, that's the biggest cliffhanger ever, right? That's like an inception when the top is spinning, and then it wobbles, and then poof, it's over. No sequel. We don't know what happened to Leo. Like, what are they supposed to do now? How are they supposed to catalyze the largest religious movement in the history of the world with no money, no power, no education, no step-by-step process, by the way? How do you make a disciple? What is the church really supposed to look like? Like, what is ministry? A lot of division over that in church. There's over a thousand Christian denominations in the world because we're all interpreting it differently. (laughs) A lot lot of division. They had no money, no power, no Instagram. What did they have? Unity. They had the Holy Spirit who brought them into such unity over Jesus and his mission. And whenever they did face division, whenever they did face an obstacle, that's what they fell back on. They're like, well, he rose from the grave, you know, so I'm good. You good? 
You know, like, do you believe that too? Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to God? You do? Come on in, you know? Yeah, but what about 1 Timothy? Listen, we'll talk about it, you know? But come on in. Let's be together. That's what they were known for. (laughs) They they were known for being together, being in unity. They, They were known for what they were for, not what they were against. I'll say it like this. I think the first Christians were more known, more excited for what they were for, not what they were against. And, and let me ask you, do you think that's true of the church today? <laughs> that we are more known for what we're for and being for people? And No, I think a lot of the church is known for really not just what we are against, but who we are against. More than we are for people and for Jesus. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of drama. And let's be honest, it's not very hard to find. The media loves it. <laughs> drama sells. Division sells. Why? Because we love it, right? We eat it for breakfast every morning. We love it. God hates it especially in his church, right? And that's why the enemy wants to actually divide us. But look at God's heart for us in John chapter 17. Jesus prays for us. I love it. Jesus prays for unity for me and you when we're not praying for unity for me and you. And here's what Jesus says. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I'm in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Verse 22, I have given them the glory you gave me. Hallelujah. So they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience, not just talk about, not just read about, not just think about. May they actually experience perfect unity so that the world will know that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. Jesus is praying that we'd have unity together, right? He loves us. He knows how exhausting division is. It's very exhausting to be divided from God and divided from each other. In fact, I think God looks at all of us, the people he made in his image, and I think he thinks, man, I wish they could all just get along, you know? (laughs) I wish they could all love each other. Like, I've been praying the last couple years that we would all see that the devil has tipped his hand, that he's overplayed division, like a little too much. It's too much division, like everything, you know? And I just pray that some people would wake up one day and be like, man, I'm tired. This It's so tiring hating you, you know? It's so tiring being on my side. I've been on my side for nine years. Maybe you have like a, you know, a family member and you can't go to family things anymore because you're on your side. I'm going to stay over here now. You know, they're on their side and I'm on my side. It's like, yo, that's so tiring. Hopefully one day we wake up and we're like, wow, I'm tired, man. I don't want to be on my side or your side. Let's be on his side. What do you think? You know, that's better. That's what Jesus is praying for, for us, that we would forgive and not look at each other as the enemy anymore but we would all be on his side. How do we do that? How do we be on his side in unity? Thanks for asking. There's three things that we need, I think, from the scripture. And here's the first one. Number one, we all need the same person. And his name's Jesus. And I think we all need him the same. (laughs) And sometimes we forget that. When we forget that we all need Jesus the same, I think we operate more like the divided states of America, not the United States of America, even in church. Like church is an interesting place. I think more so than any arena in society, church has the ability to bring people together who have nothing in common. Like me and you are different, have you noticed? You all are very different. Sometimes we don't think that, like we get caught up in our echo chamber, like everyone thinks like me and everyone acts like me and everyone in church wants what I want. No, that's very not true. I get all the emails and all the feedback. Y'all are very different, you know? Like people like different leadership styles, different preaching styles, different worship styles, different architecture styles, really? Um, Different small group styles. It never ends. <laughs> now, let me tell you, I don't see that, that as a bad thing. It's called diversity, and diversity has many layers, and that's one of them. We're all kind of different, and that's cool. <laughs> if we were all the same, that'd be boring. If we all looked the same, talked the same, liked the same thing, I, I, think, that would, I think that would be boring. Yeah, there's diversity, and that's a good thing. Here's the problem. The enemy wants diversity to lead to division, that it would actually separate us, and we go on different sides. Here's the problem with that in Revelation 7. The Bible says when we're in heaven worshiping Jesus, every nation, every tribe, every tongue is going to be there. People from other denominations are going to be there. People will be there that surprise you. You're like, how'd they get in? Wow. You know? Why? Because they're different than you. You're not the same. But apparently that is no longer a prerequisite for unity that we all have to be the same. And we all have to agree on every verse. And we all have to like the same things. No, no, no. That's not why we actually come together, right? We don't come together because we like the same things or agree on every single thing. We come together because we need the same person. His name's Jesus. We need him, and we all need him the same. And Joshua realizes his need for this being. (laughs) 
And that's really what changed his life in this moment. The Bible says that he's getting ready for Jericho, and he looks over, and behold, the commander's there. And the word behold lets us know that he was not ready for it. It was not on his eye calendar, no notification that the commander was going to show up, and he was there. Right? And he realizes it's God, and so he falls on his face, and he begins to worship him. And he seemingly forgets his cause. He forgets his question. He forgets his thing. <laughs> he's just like, I need this guy. And he worships Jesus. How do we know it's Jesus? Well, first of all, it's God. Joshua is not worshiping any other God than God. The Bible says he's on holy ground. It tells him to remove his sandals. That's reminiscent of Exodus chapter 3. God shows up to Moses at the burning bush, and he says, remove your sandals. You're on holy ground. Why is it holy? Because Elohim is there. <laughs> God is there. It's the same picture. Jesus, the commander of the armies of the Lord, is there, which is how Jesus is described in Revelation 19. John on the island of Patmos describes Jesus in a very strong way, and I'm not sure it's the way that we all look at Jesus. <laughs> I'm not sure it's the same picture of Jesus you have in your mind. I call him Thug Jesus. He's got tattoos on his leg. He's got a white robe dipped in blood. He's got crowns on his head. He's got fire in his eyes. It's crazy. In fact, I think we have it, right? Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. John says this, Then I saw heaven open, and that's Jesus. He's the heaven opener, right? And behold, there's our word. <laughs> He's jolted. He's shocked. Sometimes Jesus just shows up when I least expect it. John on Patmos is just as startled as Joshua is in Jericho. Behold, a white horse. <laughs> I don't know if you grew up watching westerns, um, but the good guy always comes in on a white horse. It's biblical, right? Look it up. Here it is. He comes in on a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like flames of fire. On his head are many diadems or crowns. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a white robe dipped in blood. That's crazy. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Verse 14, And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him, the commander on white horses. From his mouth comes a sword from which he strikes the nations and the enemy. Verse 16, here's the last verse. It says that he will tread the winepress of the fury God the Almighty, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord, and that's why I call it Thug Jesus. That's a crazy picture of Jesus. I don't know if we have that picture of him usually, but um, just so we're all clear, that's the guy we're all going to face one day, him. <laughs> it's a little different than first coming Jesus, and I'm going to talk about first coming Jesus in just a second, but um, that's the guy we're all going to face one day. And I don't know about you, but I need him. You know what I mean? He don't need me. He doesn't need me on his team. He doesn't need to join my team. I need to be on his team. I need him. And I, and I think sometimes we could be all be a little bit more honest about how much we need that guy. We all need him. <laughs> the same. And I think sometimes we try to act like, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good, man. Like church is the place where we come and act like we're better than we really are. <laughs> and we stuff our things away. And listen, that's not what this is. We are a group of ordinary people. We're all struggling. This is not a resort, it's a rehab. That's what we said in chapter, it's a rehab for Rahab. That was chapter two, in case you missed that week. There's the recap. But um, we're all struggling. We're all winning and losing. Let's not try to act like we're doing one without the other. <laughs> some of us are recovering addicts of power and money and attention. And Sometimes we say that, sometimes we don't. Right? We want this to be a place where you are seen, not used. Heard, not talked at. <laughs> Love, not leveraged. We're trying to be nice Christians. I know, I know. That's an oxymoron for some of us. Bear with me, right? But we're trying. <laughs> like, why are all those things true? Because we all need them the same. <laughs> and when we remember that, we're not enemies anymore because we're all in the same boat. <laughs> we're not enemies anymore. In fact, we share an enemy, and that's point number two. We, we need to have the same enemy. And my favorite picture of this is in Acts chapter 16. I'm not going to read it for time because we've got to baptize some people. You know what I mean? But um, you can read it later. Acts chapter 16, Paul goes and starts the Philippian church, which is interesting because that church is known for joy, and the first member of the church is a demon-possessed girl. <laughs> you can go read it starting in verse 16 in chapter 16. What it says, essentially, Paul goes to UTC Mall, and he starts inviting people to church, right? He's handing out invite cards. And as he's doing that, this girl shows up and starts yelling at him. The Bible says Paul gets annoyed, and I can relate to that. You know what I mean? Sometimes people are annoying. Anyway, in case you didn't get it. But um, he gets annoyed, and um, it's interesting because in that moment, he could call security, right? He could, he could film her and put it on TikTok. Look at this crazy. He could tell her to kick rocks. He doesn't do any of that stuff. In fact, he goes toward her, not away. 
He leans in, not, not out, and, and he prays for her. The enemy in this moment is bringing division. The Holy Spirit is bringing unity. And he leans in on towards her, and he prays for her. And the Holy Spirit comes and drives the demon out. And he heals this woman. And she becomes the first member of the Philippian church. And what we learn in this story is that Paul is gracious towards the girl, but not very gracious towards the demon. Towards the demon, he gets thug Jesus. You know what I mean? Revelation 19. By the way, we read Revelation 19, and in no way is that God saying that the church should be militant. You know, like we should take up arms and have like words of hate against people. No, that's not what it's saying. The Bible teaches us to be like first coming Jesus with people. First coming Jesus is a little different, right? He's humble. He's lowly. He's relatable. He's born into captivity. He's born into poverty. He goes towards the least of these. He's not militant. He says, if your enemy strikes you on the cheekbone, turn to him the other also. Pray for your enemies, love and bless those who persecute you. We should all be a little bit more like first coming Jesus towards people. But to the enemy, we should be like second coming. I think that's a slide. With, with people, we should be like first coming. With the enemy, we should be like second coming thug Jesus, who, by the way, is undefeated. He's never lost. First coming, Jesus took a beating once. And it's never happening again. And he went to the cross willingly, by the way. The devil didn't put him on it. He went there for me and you because he wanted to save us. And it'll never happen again. Right? He's not going around fighting the devil. He already beat the devil. Jesus and the Bible give less respect to the enemy than we do. So does Paul. He's like, he's annoying. That's what the Bible says. He gets annoyed and he prays for him to leave. And I don't know. We should just be a church, right, that's annoyed with darkness but in love with people. We need some more married people that are annoyed, not at their spouse but at the enemy trying to ruin your marriage. That's the real enemy, not your spouse, right? We need some parents who are annoyed, not at their kids because they do dumb stuff, right? But at the enemy who's trying to steal their faith. We need some of the church who gets a little bit annoyed, not at the people of crazy town California, right? But the darkness that's all around us all the time. They want to hang in there. They want to go in when other people are running out, right? This is who God has called us to be. How many times do we stand before God and we're in a dispute with another person, you know? Maybe it's our spouse or our ex or our boss or our friend. And we're like, God, which side are you on? You on my side or their side? And God's like, no, actually, I'm on my side. I'm on unity side. I'm on humility side. I'm on healing side. <laughs> I'm on my side. I'm not on your side, right? And all we can do is ask God to give us his eyes for people, that we would see him the way that he does. You might be in a dispute with somebody. God, let me see them the way you do. They're not the enemy. <laughs> let me pray for people I've been talking some stuff about. I need to do that. And when I'm, a, when I'm on your side, God, I take on your mission. And that's point number three. And I've been waiting to get to point number three the whole time. That was all an intro. Can I start preaching? Anyway, number three, we have to baptize people. Let's hurry. Okay, number three, we need the same mission. Sometimes we get really caught up on side quests. You know, there's a lot of things in this world that are done in Jesus' name that have nothing to do with Jesus where we think Jesus is in on it with us, and he's not. <laughs> I don't know exactly what was on Joshua's heart in chapter 5. All I know is whatever was on his heart was not on Jesus' heart. They weren't on the same page, right? Maybe they were on different missions, and I don't think that's very hard to do. I think we do that with Jesus all the time. What I'm learning in my life, though, is if I'm not on the same mission as Jesus, Jesus is going to frustrate me a lot. Jesus is slow to jump on my bandwagon and do my thing is what I've noticed. Like when you read the gospel, it's fascinating to study what Jesus does do. It's also fascinating to study what he doesn't do. He doesn't do a lot of stuff. Jesus is born in an interesting time. He's born into poverty. He's born into captivity. The government has never been more corrupt. The church has never been more corrupt. There's all these causes he could have been a part of, and he, he's not a part of any of them. People came to Jesus all the time. Hey, can you help solve this and help you know, get this person in office and help get rid of these people? And he's like, I'm not here for that. Jesus, can you get rid of the Pharisees? They act like they care about us. They just love the Romans' money. Can we get rid of them? Jesus is like, I'm, I'm not here for that. Jesus didn't pick and choose causes. He didn't get wrapped up in cultural dilemmas as much as we do. We get very wrapped into stuff, and it's not saying that it's not important. It's just not ultimate to Jesus all the time. He said, I'm here for one thing. That's to make a way to my Father. <laughs> it's the only reason I'm here. I'm making a way to God. And if you want to know why Jesus came, read the book of John. He says it over and over and over and over again. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, John 4, he says, I'm the well. John 6, I'm the bread. John 10, I'm the gate. John 11, I'm the resurrection and the life. John 14, I'm the way. John 15, I'm the vine. He just says it over and over and over. This is why I'm here. I'm leading people back home to God. 
right? And then if we're in his army, that's what we're to do, just lead people back home. Everything else is a side quest. And that is frustrating if you're on Jesus' team. Like I look at his 12 disciples, and they're interesting people. Like one of them is Simon the Zealot, and zealots are revolutionaries. They're leading an insurrection to overthrow the Roman government because they were corrupt and bad and they were pagan, right? You might be like, what about the Roman Catholic Church? That came much later, okay? And so they, they were like against God. So I could see Simon running up one day and say, hey, let's go overtake the Romans. Come on, and like, let's go. Jesus, you coming? No, not here for that, you know? One of his disciples is Matthew, the tax collector. People hated tax collectors. They were government-sanctioned thieves, all right? There were no taxes that were stated anywhere. So taxes, unlike today, were very confusing back then, you know? And so, and so they would come up to your house, and they would just make it up on the fly. And if they walked up to your house and you had a yacht in front of your house, they'd add a little bit more, you know? If your grass was perfectly cut, they'd add a little bit more. If you had one of those Dutch doors, you know what I mean? They'd add a little bit more. And they would just make it up. So people hated them. So a group of Jews got together and said, let's get rid of these guys. They are evil and corrupt. Come on, let's go. Jesus, you coming? No, (laughs) I'm not here for that. I can imagine Peter saying, hey, man, that five loaves and two fish thing was pretty awesome. You know, let's do that again. That was cool that it was free the first time, really good for PR. Let's start a fast food chain, you know? Burger King of Kings, let's do it. In fact, tomorrow we have a tour of the first store. Come on, Jesus, let's go. You coming? We got seven minutes. The real estate guy's there. No, you're going to have to go on without me. I'm not here for that. And I wonder how many times we've done that to Jesus. Jesus, come join my thing. Come on, it's for you, right? If you give me this job, it's going to be paying a lot. Then I can start tithing. It's for you. Jesus, help me build my following so I can tell people about you. It's for you. And Jesus is like, I'm not here for that. Right? I- I'm, not, I'm not here for that. No. And we're like, why? Don't you like my five-year plan? No. <laughs> but I like you. Want to be in my army? <sighs> yes. Jesus, thanks for the offer to be in your army. I want to be in your army, but first got to go do this thing first. And if I'll do this thing, if I could just do this thing, I'll be in your army. Right? I just got to get the house. It has four bedrooms. Then I'll be four bedrooms guy. Can you imagine that? Right? And Jesus is like, nobody cares how many bedrooms. No, they care. People care how many bedrooms I have. Right? She's like, nobody knows how many. No, they do. I sent them the address. They looked it up on Zillow. She's like, no, they didn't. Nobody cares. Jesus, I have to do this. If I don't do this, who am I? Who am I? This is what I was made to do. And Jesus would look at us and say, no, it's not. That's not who I made you to be. That's not who you are. Well, then who am I? You're mine. I just want you in my army. Do you remember that old song, that old classic, that old hymn? Such deep theological meaning. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I love this church. Come on, man. Some theologians at the 11 a.m. Come on now. I did that at 9.30 and nobody knew the song. It's crazy. All the lost people go to 9.30. <laughs> We're not, are we filming this? Anyway, um, <laughs> I may never shoot the artillery. Yeah, but Jesus, the artillery's kind of my thing though, you know? And if I don't shoot the artillery, who am I? I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, though, am I really in his army or am I trying to get him to be in my army? Sometimes it's like I give God a job description for how he can better serve me. I said this earlier, but it's hard to follow Jesus when I'm trying to get Jesus to follow me. (laughs) Meanwhile, Joshua's on his face worshiping God. (laughs) He's having a behold moment where Jesus shows up again in the middle of our side quest and he says, let me help you a little bit. It's embarrassing. I was writing this message this week. It's embarrassing how many behold moments I need every week to get me back on track. Almost every day I get sidetracked with an insecurity, with a goal, with another thing that I get to do. Come on, Jesus, let's go. (laughs) And then Jesus shows up and rocks you. And you have what I call a behold moment. You ever have a behold moment? That's when Jesus shows up more. (laughs) Does God ever show up more in your life? 
The Bible says he is omnipresent. He's in all places at all times. But I have found that sometimes God is more. <laughs> he shows up and it's holy ground. That's what Luke says in Acts. He clothes us with power from on high. I think what that means is, is most of this journey with God is we're just walking with dad hand in hand. We're walking down the pathway of life and not every day is miracles, signs, and wonders. I'm not feeling it every day. But there's faith there and I'm just enjoying his common grace. God's there. But there will be moments on this journey where he startles us where he sweeps us off our feet, he pulls us in close for a stronger moment, where he shows up more. It's what Kim Walker called a sloppy, wet kiss. A lot of people couldn't handle that, right? Because we don't look at God like that. He's not a lover, he's not a startler. And yet this is what God likes to do. <laughs> he shows up and he beholds us. And in that moment, I'm not sure anything else matters. Joshua forgets his question. <laughs> he forgets his cause. He's like, I don't need that. I just want him. And he's delighting in the Lord. That's what David says, Psalm 34. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Honestly, sometimes I walk into God's presence. I have a lot of desires. And my desires are shaped in the form of a house and a goal and a mountain and a thing to achieve. And then I delight in the Lord, and all of a sudden, he reshapes it into himself. <laughs> now all I want is him. <laughs> and what I have found out is that when you're delighting in the Lord, you're not asking him for more stuff. You're giving stuff back. You're like, here, take it. <laughs> you know, Take the side quest. Take the pressures and the goals. I don't want them anymore. I just want you. <laughs> I don't need all this stuff. Why? Because it's really heavy. Have you noticed how heavy life is? Isn't that weird, though? Jesus is like, my yoke is easy and my burden's light. You're like, really? Life is not light. I don't know if you remember this. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. I think it's the greatest invitation on this side of eternity. Jesus says, are you tired? Yes. <laughs> are you worn out? Are you sick of religion? Definitely. Come take a walk with me, right? And on this walk, because you've been running, you need to slow down. Let's just walk. You need to calm yourself, right? And on this walk, we're going to make an exchange. You're going to give me your stress, and it's probably coming from the side quest and the goal and the pressure I didn't give you. You're going to give me that, and I'm going to give you rest. That's a good deal for us. But then he says this phrase I'm not sure we really understand. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And you might be able to recite that from Sunday school, but what does that mean? In Hebrew culture, whenever there was a yoke, it was never a single yoke. It was a double yoke, <laughs> It was for two animals. In fact, I think we have a picture of it. This is what a yoke would look like in Hebrew culture. And so Jesus is not saying, I'm going to yoke you and, and put your life on top of you and you're calling on you. He's actually saying, I'm in the yoke. Want to join me? Come join my yoke. Why is the burden light? Because I'm in the yoke with you. And in Hebrew culture, usually one side of this yoke would be bigger than the other because they would put the strongest animal with the weakest animal so the stronger could carry the weaker. And I don't know if you know, but we're not the stronger. Jesus is saying, come let me carry you <laughs> to my yoke and my main quest. The problem is we often yoke ourselves to a bunch of side quests, and they're really heavy. Why? Because Jesus ain't in the yoke with us. Jesus, you coming? Nope. <laughs> I'm not here for that. And we'll get mad at God for it. God, why aren't you helping, you know? Why aren't you helping with the thing? Come on, God. It's just me out here? It is just you out here. <laughs> why? Oh, they already got it. No, there it is. Jesus doesn't owe me energy for side quests he didn't yoke me to. <laughs> He's like, I didn't call you to that. Why would I give you energy to accomplish something I'm not calling you to accomplish? I don't need that for you. That's not good for you. I know you want to do more. No, that's not good for you. Jesus, you coming? No. <laughs> Joshua's in the fight of his life. You coming to Jericho? He's like, no, 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 no. You're not carrying me to Jericho. I'm carrying you there. <laughs> we don't carry Jesus. Any God we carry is actually an idol, right? When I put my family on my back, when I put this church on my back, it becomes an idol. <laughs> Can't carry God. He's God. He's the commander. <laughs> and there might be something in your life today that's a pressure, it's a goal, and it's an insecurity. And you say, man, it's so heavy, and I don't want to carry it anymore. Let this be holy ground today <laughs> where you can put it down there. And I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to give it back, Jesus, because I just want you, and I want to join your army. And I got to pray because we got to baptize people. So let's pray. Let's pray out. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for showing up in our lives. I pray for some of us today. You'd give us a behold moment. You would show up unexpectedly. You'd speak into our life. Oh, Lord, thank you for giving us a role to play on your mission. Would you clarify today what is a main mission and what is a side quest? Maybe there's something that's really heavy because it's not from you. And so would you, would you speak to us right now? Would you illuminate what that is? 
the weights that are heavy. Life's really heavy. There's probably something on our plate you didn't give us. Would we lay it down? For the things you did give us that are heavy, would you give us strength today? Would we trust you today? Would we step into your yoke? Would we maybe picture that in our head? I'm in his yoke. That's why it's light, because I'm yoked to him. Help us do that today, Lord. For, for anyone that says, hey, I want to be on Jesus' team. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to get baptized. I just want to pray for you quick. What that begins with is surrender. you saying, I'm turning from my sin today. I'm admitting that I am a sinner in need of saving, but I believe Jesus died to save me. If you're acknowledging that today, you're confessing with your mouth, that's me, I'm a sinner, but you're committing today. I want to be in his army the rest of my life. If that's you, I want to pray for you. God, would you become the realest thing in this person's life? Would they know that you died to save them? This church largely exists for them, this moment, to welcome them in the family. Maybe the next ask, when we say, we're in your army, yes, sir, I'm in the Lord's army, yes, sir. Maybe the yes, sir moment for us is getting baptized. Maybe it's saying yes. But God, I pray that collectively, we would all walk out of here as a church family with a yes, sir spirit. Whatever it is you're calling me to do, yes, sir. And the side quest, holy ground. You told him to take off his sandals. Some of us are wearing sandals that are taking us to side quests. And today we take them off and we leave them here. I don't need that pressure. I don't need that voice. I don't need that insecurity. I'm giving it back because I'm delighting again. Help us join your army. God, we pray for those getting baptized right now that we would celebrate, we would love, we would hug, we would pray, whether we know them or not, we would just get excited because you are. And so God, we praise you. We love you. Thank you for what you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen.